So this week we're picking up where we left off last week in our spirit, our uh, series on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Last week Ray did a great job of uh, talking about the basics of who the Holy Spirit is, how we have one God that's three in person. Doesn't mean we serve three gods, we serve one that is triune. Um, we talked about who the Holy Spirit is, what he does. He does some amazing things. You know, as I was thinking about this and prepping for the sermon and talking to some friends, I was reminded of some of the things the Spirit does that, that just defy logic and reality. Um, what I mean by that is I remember a number of years ago being at work at the bank in West Lafayette, and I was doing some scripture journaling that morning before going into work, and I just said, God, you know, I would love to be able to share the gospel with someone today. Please, please bring someone into my life. Please bring someone to the bank that I can talk to about that. And so who showed up but a wonderful postdoc um, in hotel and tourism management from China. And I happened to speak a little bit of Mandarin Chinese because, I don't know, my mind works that way. I picked it up and, and he, he just, we had an awesome time talking. And he looks at me and he goes, we're going to go get coffee later today. And I went, <laughs> okay, all right, Lord, I see what you're doing. So we went and got coffee. Um, it was a surreal experience because I got to share the gospel with him and he looked at me and he goes, okay, cool, that's all well and good, but what do you mean by God? Just a surreal experience, but got to talk to him about this, got to show him what I meant by God, got to run through scripture with him. And a couple weeks later, he was like, hey, so you remember we talked about all that stuff? My mom back in China called me and said, uh, hey, a friend invited me to one of these Christian churches. Do you think I should go? And he said, yeah, I know a Christian. He's pretty cool. You should head there. <laughs> so she went, and apparently she became a believer because I sat down with him because he told his mom, yeah, Christians are cool, and she came to Christ thousands of miles away, Right? How cool is that? That's the kind of things that the Holy Spirit does, moving pieces around, working in people's hearts, doing things like that. So it's pretty exciting to think about God being in us and what happened to her when she, when she came to Christ. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says this. It says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Last week, Ray reminded us the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, God Almighty, makes his dwelling with us when we turn from our sin and we place our faith in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. What does that mean? What does that mean? On a theological, on a practical level, what benefit do we get? To what end? So today what I want to do is, is talk about the, the meteor aspects of this. Um, we're going to focus on four main points today, and, and in true pastorly fashion, it spells out the word safe. We're going to find out that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit at the moment that we are saved. We're going to find out that we have assurance of eternal life that we're free from slavery to sin and that we're empowered to do his will because of the indwelling spirit. So why don't we pray and then let's look at the scripture to see what that means for our lives. Lord God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all the ways that you bless us. Lord God, thank you that you are working behind the scenes that you're working in our hearts and in our minds, that you're convicting the world of sin, that you're drawing all men to yourself. Lord God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Thank you that you've saved us, Lord, and help us to look at your word here and understand what that means. Amen. Well, the first point is we are sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. 
Where do I get that from? Well, straight from Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What's wonderful is these verses span across several of those four points, but we're going to focus on the sealed part here. This word guarantee that we see here, what do you think of when you think of a guarantee? You think of oh, what sales tactics, right? You think of a guarantee you like all ch our chicken or money back guarantee. Well, the Greek word here is arabon. It's, it's more than simply a guarantee. It's more like a down payment or more correctly, a first payment, the first of many contractual payments to come. So the Holy Spirit has been given to those who believe as a down payment securing our inheritance is what this is saying. Having been a banker for 13 years, this appeals to me, right? I know what down payments are. You give me five grand and you're going to go get a truck. Okay, awesome, but I've got that five grand. No matter what you do to that truck, guess what? I've got your money. So the Holy Spirit is given to us as that down payment, as that guarantee, as that first of many payments. Him living in and with us here and now is a precursor to the eternal home that we'll enjoy with God forever. Isn't that cool? It's amazing. We've been guaranteed our inheritance, our inheritance in heaven by God himself sealing us. The Holy Spirit's a down payment, the first payment of many to come in growing and knowing and living out his will first here and then in the hereafter. That's why it breaks my heart so much to see on your Facebook feed and in TikTok reels and Instagram shorts and all sorts of things like that, charlatans preaching that, that godliness is a means of temporal financial gain. It breaks my heart. How sad is it to think that these, these temporal blessings compare in any way to the eternal presence of Christ forever? I know I've used this before, but C.S. Lewis says, it's like kids that sit around playing with mud pies because they can't imagine what you mean when you say we're going for a holiday at the beach. What a disappointing thing to put our hopes in. In John 6, 27, Jesus says this, Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. That's the same word right there. That word seal is used in the last passage in this one. And what that seal is, it's a mark, it's a seal, it's a brand. It's a symbol of ownership, of, of where he came from, who he belongs to, the provenance. So in, th in that same way, we've been permanently marked by the Holy Spirit if we come to know him. If we know Christ, we've forever been changed. Now I say that, and when I say that, I have to address this controversy around the idea of once saved, always saved. I don't know if you've seen that or heard that, but, well, let's, let's, let's tackle a couple of verses here. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, it says this, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Note that while we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us as believers, it's still possible to grieve the Spirit of God. And how? By our sinful behavior. We can grieve the Spirit by our actions. The preceding and the following verses tell us to abandon coarse language, inappropriate joking, tearing people down, slander, maliciousness, and the like. These are things that grieve God's spirit because that's so against his character. They should be against ours as well since he lives within every believer. But I want you to notice something. 
Does it say whom you were sealed until you did something so bad that he gets done with you? No, it says we are sealed for the day of redemption. That's forever. That's a promise of God, and God can't lie. And so we have assurance in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Romans 7 now. If we have Christ, we are assured of eternal life. What do I mean? Well, Paul says this. Romans 7. And I I really encourage you to read this entire chapter. And In fact, the whole book of Romans is wonderful, but Right here in 7.15, he says, For I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And he talks about being stuck in sin, about continuing to sin, though he wants to follow God with his heart and his mind. His flesh still, still wants to turn to sin. He says this, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thankfully, he doesn't stop there. He says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul, this amazing man who met the risen Christ, who wrote nearly half of the New Testament, who poured out his life as an offering to God, and dealt with unbelievable heartbreak, torture, imprisonment, and ultimately death for Christ. He admits that he still deals with these sinful desires and these urges, and he fails over and over and over again. For someone who had actually seen the risen Christ, who had been tapped on the shoulder by God Almighty himself, heard his audible voice, to deal with this? Is it any wonder that we also deal with that stuff? In our world of excess, our world of carnality, is it any wonder that we deal with the same issues? We still have this battle to fight every day, but the fact of the matter is the war was won on Calvary's cross. We still have a flesh that pulls at us, that nags us, that screams at us to do what it wants rather than what God wants. But in Christ, we have salvation. Let's look at what the Holy Spirit says through Paul directly after this passage. In Romans 8, 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Damnation or eternal separation from God are an impossibility for anyone who has come to place their trust in Jesus Christ. So this is a permanent state. What do I mean? Well, turn with me to Acts 1 and in verse 4 and 5. It says, and, with, and Jesus, while staying with them, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, I've got to define this. Baptism in the Spirit is a phrase that gets bandied about, but what it really is is just the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The idea that what Ray shared last week. Jesus promised us a paraclete, a helper to stay with us, and, and this is it being fulfilled This permanence, though, I have to point out, is not the same as cheap grace. What do I mean by that? Some people will say, well, I'm saved because I prayed a prayer 30 years ago, and that's fine, and I'm going to live my life however I feel like now, and do whatever I want, and sin as much as I want because the blood of Christ covers me. Because of that, some pastors... Um, in recent years, have gone to war with the sinner's prayer. Have you heard anyone talk about that? In one sense, they're right to do that. Why do I say that? Well, their contention is that we as the church have stripped belief in Christ from truly admitting our sin and our need from a Savior, repenting of our sin and coming to Him, instead saying that just simply saying a prayer is all you need to do for salvation. 
The sinner's prayer can be a valuable tool for summing up someone's decision to trust Christ, to repent from dead works to new life. But the fact is, someone can say a prayer without actually believing anything that they're saying. They can say a prayer because they feel pressured or because they think it's what their parents and their friends and their family want them to do. So from that standpoint, I agree. We shouldn't rely on a prayer to be what saves us. The prayer itself has never saved anyone. Only repentance from sin and belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross is what saved us. You can believe that without saying a prescripted prayer. That said, I also don't want to diminish the sinner's prayer as a valuable tool to help a new believer collect their thoughts, to express to Jesus their understanding of their sin, their need for a Savior, and their thankfulness that he provided a way out. That's good. That part is good. So that's why I wouldn't say I'm going to war with the sinner's prayer. I'd say let, let's understand it properly in its right context. Understand that the prayer itself is not what saves, but the repentance and the changing of mind, the turning from sin to Christ is what saves people. So all that to say, you need to be careful not to tell someone if you pray to prayer, you're good. They very, mel- they very well may not be if they're trusting in that prayer rather than in the person of Christ. Does that make sense? I hope so. So, that said, I look, at the, I, I look at the phrase, once saved, always saved. And I think a lot of people think about being saved as I prayed a prayer once. So, maybe I change that. Maybe I change that to once sealed, always sealed. That, how's that sound? I'd wholeheartedly agree that once a person has truly placed their faith in Christ alone and been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, baptized into him, guaranteeing their place in heaven, they can have true assurance, 100% confidence in their salvation. Why do I think that? Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 17, Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There is no room for removing or losing your salvation in that verse. We spoke earlier about Ephesians 4.30, that we've been sealed for the day of redemption. Adam Harwood, in his book, Christian Theology, says, there's no threat of loss of status as God's child because of that promise. We've been sealed for the day of redemption. We have been given the Holy Spirit as a promise. So here's a thought exercise for you. If you truly have the Holy Spirit of God as the down payment for the joy that's to come when Christ returns or calls us home, How could you possibly be separated from God in eternal hell? You can't, because God himself is with you. If you've truly accepted the gospel. So because of that sealing, we can recognize something else wonderful. Not only are we sealed, not only are we assured of our salvation, but we're also free from the law of sin. Romans 6 says this in verse 20 and following. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Christ has set us free. We no longer have to do those things that our flesh wants. We have the Spirit, the Helper, the Paraclete to help us live a life that pleases God. So odd, though, 
the way that this is phrased. Either we're slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. You don't get another choice. There's no other option. Either you're following God wholeheartedly and belong to him or you belong to sin. Those are the two options. Those are the two kinds of people that exist on this planet. Later in the same letter to the Romans, Paul says this. Romans 8, 2, and then 9 through 11. He says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. That's awesome. So because we believe in Christ, we're sealed for the day of redemption from his spirit. We're permanently adopted into his family. We're inseparably indwelt by God himself. And that points us back to, once again, why it's so important not to grieve the spirit, not to fall back into these patterns, because there's nothing. What did he say? What fruit were you getting from that lifestyle? There's no benefit to falling back into sin, especially now that you have the promised Holy Spirit especially now that you've been sealed for eternity. So our lives should point toward that reality. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 and, and following says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. He says such were some of you, those things that you were slaves to, those things that you thought you had to do, those things you were addicted to, can be gone because you have the Holy Spirit. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. The beauty of turning to Christ and away from sins is that we can lay down these things these things that have such a hold on our lives and we can be washed clean by the blood of Christ. Galatians 5, 1 is similar. It says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Again, before we knew Christ, we were slaves to that sin, and now we're free. We can say no to that sin because we have the power of God Almighty living in us. Not to do our own will. Not to be empowered to do what the world says is important. But to be empowered to live lives that please God and point others to him. So we're empowered. We're empowered by the Spirit. But it's important to understand what that empowerment actually entails. Acts 1.8 says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. For context, the disciples were asking Jesus, now that he'd come back, is now the time that he's going to give them political victory over the Romans? Is he going to restore the, the monarchy or the, the government to the Jewish people? And Christ says, you guys are still thinking in terms of worldly power and worldly salvation, even though he was so clearly a spiritual savior. He tells them, it's not for you to know these things, but rather you'll receive power from the Holy Spirit. It's going to indwell you, and this is going to allow you to be his witnesses to the resurrection, to the remotest parts of the earth, to the completion of the prophets of old. So why are we empowered? We are empowered not for earthly reasons, not for our blessings here, but for re reasons pertaining to the kingdom of God. Going back to 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says this in verse 14 and following, Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we're the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing and then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since then, we have these promises. Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing a holiness to completion in the fear of God. Seems like a tall order, right? Cleanse ourselves, right? But we can do that now. Why? Is it really us cleansing ourselves or is it us being able to cleanse ourselves because we have the Spirit? The beauty is we can do it now. Not in our own power, but through the promised Holy Spirit, through God Almighty living in us and working through us. We've been sealed by His promised Spirit. We have full assurance of salvation if we're in Christ. We're free from the law of sin and death, and we've been empowered to live righteously in that Spirit. We're safe in His arms. Last thing I want to address in closing is, okay, great. Let's, let's admit all this is true, right? Seems scriptural. Let's, let's do that. Why don't I feel that way, though? Does that ever happen? I know all this stuff is true, but it doesn't feel that way. A couple things going on. First, we have to remember that spiritual warfare is real. It's going on around us all the time. And we can still believe lies that throw us off, that make us feel like none of this matters, that make us feel small and unimportant and worthless. Bill Bright has a wonderful illustration with a train. I'm sad David's not here to see this. My buddy, my little buddy loves trains so much. He could tell you what kind that is. He says this, fact precedes faith, precedes feeling. What drives the train is the fact, the fact that we are sealed, assured, free, and empowered. All those things are true in us because of the Holy Spirit that we have, because we believe in Christ. This is non-negotiable and this is scriptural. Anyone who tells you differently is trying to lay a burden on you that you were never meant to bear. The world has this backwards, though. Here's the thing. Once you've got the fact and you place your faith in that, the feelings follow. That's, that's what the train is about. Imagine instead trying to pull the train by the feelings, if you will. The world has it backwards. They want to feel good about something before they put their faith in it, and they couldn't care less about the facts. How often do you see that? Well, I don't care if it's hurting me because it makes me feel good right now. Yep. Who cares about whether it's true? But we hear the word of faith. We're sorry, we hear the word of truth, not the word of faith. We hear the word of truth and then comes faith. At a certain point, you've got to make that decision to place your life into Christ. You can know about his salvation all day, but until you say, okay, God, I agree that I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need your salvation, and I turn from my sin, and I believe in your son, then nothing can happen. But once you've embraced the fact through faith, then the feelings can follow. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a biblical example of how that worked. Exodus 3, verses 10 through 12. God says to Moses, Come, I will send you to the Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I 
that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. But he said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses' feelings were kind of a mess, weren't they? He's hearing directly from the God of the universe. And he's saying, but I'm just, I mean, I'm just a little guy. The fact was, he was talking with God Almighty. The fact was, God said he'd be with Moses the whole time. But God still required Moses to follow him in faith. What do I mean? Well, what does he say? He doesn't say, here's your sign right now that you should follow me. He says, guess what? You're going to know that I've been with you because you're going to be up on that mountain worshiping me with all these people that you're going to free. I can't imagine Moses liking that very much. Well, can't I get a better guarantee? Can't I get something right now? Think of the Pharisees saying, hey, what sign do you give us to, to show us that you're who you say you are? And, he, he, and Christ wouldn't do it. Why? Why? Because we know the fact he wants our faith, and after we've placed our faith in him, then our feelings come. God still required Moses to follow in faith before he could take part in that feeling of awe and elation of seeing what God had promised come true on that mountain. In the very same way, we must know the fact of our salvation. We need to place our faith in the promises of God to seal us for the day of redemption. And then we can embrace the feeling of knowing that we are eternally sealed, assured that we're free, and that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So the question I have is, when you think about yourself, are you safe in him? Have you placed your faith in Christ? Or are you resting on, oh, I said a prayer 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 70 years ago? And because you know him, are you confident that you're sealed in the Holy Spirit? That you're assured of eternal life? That you're free from that slavery to sin and you're empowered to live a godly life? Because of the promises of God, if you're in Christ Jesus, all these things are true of you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for who you are. Once again, for all that you've done for us. Thank you that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. The righteous for the unrighteous, once and for all, sealing all those who would believe in you for eternal life. Help us to take hold of that salvation. Help us to live lives that glorify you at every step. And when we're hurting and when our feelings don't match up, help us to hold on to the fact of our salvation, the fact of your indwelling spirit. Help us to more and more have faith that you are who you say you are, that you do what you say you do, and you're going to do even more than we can imagine for us. And Lord, I just pray that we would focus not just on what we get from following you here, but more importantly, on what we get in eternity because of knowing you. And then we use that as fuel to love those around us, to bring as many with us as we can into your arms. Thank you that you're such a big God, that you're such a good God. And thank you that you love us so much that you would die for us. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.